All right, uh, good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1? We are resuming our classes, weekday classes this week. I haven't seen you guys during the weekday classes for the last two weeks, which is kind of strange. Uh, we don't really do that unless I'm on vacation somewhere. But uh, So it's good to get back in the swing of things. I don't, know how guys, I don't know how guys do it, pastors do it, not teaching during the week. You know, it's like if I didn't have to teach during the week, I think, I mean, I could find something to do, but it, I, it's, you got to, I mean, I don't know how you teach just once a week. I really don't. Um, so I, I, I love it. So, you know, maybe I'm crazy or something. I don't think I am. Uh, I know a few people are crazy around me, but not me. I don't think so. <laughs> hey, hey, over there. All right. Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. We're going to be uh, looking at... Uh, we're fin- uh, looking at verse 9, finishing off uh, Zephaniah 2.9 here this evening. And we'll be talking about the remnant. We'll be bringing up the remnant doctrine and also the mercy of God in this passage. In particular, we're going we're gonna to look at the, uh, uh, the last couple of um, prophetic declarations in Zephaniah 2.9, which assert that the God of Israel, or he, the God of Israel declares a remnant from his people who inherit the lands of the Moabites and the Ammonites. So we're going to be... Uh, Talking about that, and this took place in the sixth century, sixth century BC, uh, and uh, so we'll be looking at that here this evening. And uh, what else? I think um, I think that's just about it. Let's take a moment of silent prayer, as is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we're in, conf- in fellowship with God. First John one nine teaches that the confession of sin restores us to fellowship with God. We maintain that fellowship by bringing our thoughts into obedience to what the Spirit says to us in the teaching of the Word of God. And we do, when we do that, we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5.18 to be filled with the Spirit and uh, Colossians 3.16 to let the Word of Christ richly dwell in our soul. Both of those commands are synonymous with each other for a couple of reasons. One, the, if you look at the context of both those passages, the results of obeying those commands, they bear the same results. And also, uh, that should be the case because 2 Peter, 1, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21 says that the Holy Spirit has inspired the Scriptures. So uh, he speaks to us through the scriptures that he is inspired. So with that in mind, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, please do what uh, 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. Uh, Paul uh, says a lot of the same thing in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, this beautiful day that you've given to us, not only to experience creation, uh, but also to experience fellowship with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your word and the gift of the Spirit who helps us understand your word and guides us in the application of your word. We pray that he would speak to all of us as individuals and as a corporate unit here this evening. We thank you, Father, for our union and identification with your Son, Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of all of our sins, giving us the guarantee of a resurrection body and rewards if we're faithful here in time. Father, we also thank you for Titus and Jody Thompson opening up their home to us and their sacrifice, and uh, we thank you for their service, and also also, uh, Titus with his work with the sound and the recordings, the video, the audio. We thank you for the technology and his service, and we pray that you would help him in that area, give him wisdom in that area this evening with the sound and the recordings. We thank you for those who are taking part, uh, uh, listening to the message uh, through the uh, website, now live through the website or at a later date, through the recordings on the website. And we pray, Father, thank you for every one of them. And we pray, Father, that they too would be spoken to along with those already in the Thompson home. We pray, Father, that this lesson would continue to uh, enable us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to gain a greater appreciation of who and what you are, an understanding of who and what you are and what you've done for us. So, Father, we pray for this uh, service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen.
All right, it should be at Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to be initially reading from the New American Standard. Now, uh, and we'll be finishing off, as I said before, Zephaniah 2, 9. That's where we left off uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now, just a little bit uh, of and a little review, a brief review as to where we are in this book. We're more than halfway through <clears throat> this book. Zephaniah only has three chapters. We saw in verse 1 of chapter 1 of Zephaniah is the introduction to this particular book. Then verses, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 actually presents to us um, the, uh, a, a prophecy regarding a universal judgment, I mean, meaning the entire, all the nations of the earth Will be under are under, going to be under the judgment of God in the future. Then we get into verses four through thirteen of that chapter, which speaks specifically of the situation in Zephaniah's day in the seventh century B.C. And, it's, and that uh, those verses actually speak of God's in, uh, announcement of judgment against the kingdom of Judah in the seventh century B.C., the southern kingdom. Then verses fourteen through eighteen of chapter one give us the characteristics of the day of the Lord, and also Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 give characteristics for the day of the Lord as well. In the former, in verses 14 through 18 of chapter 1, these characteristics speak of, a, uh, 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 speak of uh, um, the day of the Lord in a negative sense, <clears throat> and that it's about to bring, it's going to bring in judgment for the nations of the earth. And then we get into the purpose of the, the other characteristic in verses 1 through 3, of chapter 2 is repentance. The purpose of the judgment is therefore to bring about repentance uh, 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 with the nations of the earth and in also the kingdom of Judah uh, in the 7th century BC. And also uh, we see that in, a, in an ultimate sense, in a far sense in the future during Daniel's 70th week, uh, these prophecies in Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 through 18 and also the commands in Zephaniah chapter 2 verses 1 through 3 are designed to, uh, to bring about the repentance of not only the kingdom of Judah in the 7th century BC, but also the Jews living in the Israel during the 70th week of Daniel and the Gentile nations during the 70th week of Daniel as well. Now, uh, we see here th that in, in verses 4 through, uh, 4 through 15 of chapter 2, give us the positive motivation for obeying the commands in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. Remember the command, there's a couple of commands in Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 1, uh, to, uh, basically for the faithful believers in, in, in Israel or Judah to cause the unfaithful Jews to assemble together for the purpose of repentance. Chapter 2, verse 3 is directly related, is addressed to the faithful believers uh, in Judah in the 7th century B.C., and those Jews living in this, during the 70th week of Daniel in the future. Now, verses, verse 2 of chapter 2 is giving the negative motivation for obeying these commands. Namely, don't, you won't get judged, along with these other unrepentant nations and uh, Jews. But then verses 14, 4 through 15 of chapter 2 are presenting the positive motivation in the sense that God say, says is announcing his judgment of these uh, of Judah's Gentile neighbors and that he's going to judge them. So that would mo should motivate, God wanted this to motivate the Jews in Israel to repent or to stay faithful if they already were faithful so that they can dispossess these nations that God has, is going to judge if they didn't repent as well. So we're, that's the section we're in in the book in Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 4 through 15. And also in this section, uh, we see that not only is there an announcement of judgment against the Gentile nations living in, during the 70th, uh, the seventh century B.C. in Zephaniah's day, uh, but it's also speaking of the remnant doctrine. There's going to be a small, there's going to be a remnant in, in Judah which will return from captivity, and this was fulfilled in history with the Babylonian captivity and in the, Judah, the remnant of Judah returning back to the land promised to their forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the reason why this remnant survives is because of the Abrahamic covenant and the, and the uh, attached to the, palace of the Abrahamic covenant is the, the Palestinian covenant or the land grant promising land at, to the nation of Israel. In fact, the unconditional covenants, the Abrahamic Palestinian, which is attached to the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant and the new covenant are, as we pointed out, all guarantee the unconditional nature of the promises in those covenants actually guarantees that Israel will always be a nation and that there'll always be a remnant of believers 
in the nation throughout history. In fact, the remnant today in our day and age belongs to the church. But these Jewish believers in our day and age or throughout the church age, they're actually very unique. Like the apostles, they belong to the church, but they actually do belong to Israel as well because of those Abrahamic covenants. So we see that how you can see how God is going to get Israel and the church and integrate them for his millennial kingdom and on into the, the, uh, the, uh, the new heavens and the new earth. Yet they maintain their separate identities because the church is the bride of Christ and the body of Christ. That's not said of the nation of Israel. So Jewish believers are quite uh, very, uh, very blessed and quite unique in the history of, the, of, of humanity. Now, uh, we're going to look this evening, as I said before, finish off verse 9 of chapter 2 where God is uh, declaring a remnant from his people will inherit the lands of the Moabites, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Now, just quickly by way of review, when we talk about the Moabites and the Ammonites, remember the people of Moab were descendants of Moab. Remember, he was the son of Abraham's nephew Lot, and he was the, uh, Moab was the product of an incestuous sexual union between Lot and his eldest daughter. This is according to Genesis 19.37. Now their descendants, uh, the descendants of Moab, they lived on the geographical plateau east of the Dead Sea, south of the Arnon River, and north of the Zered River, and west of the Arabian Desert. Uh, there's a map on our website that we used not too long ago that you can take a look at that shows these people. I'm not going to look at it tonight. The people of Ammon uh, that are also mentioned in this prophecy in Zephaniah 2 were located to the area east of the Jordan River. River Ammon, it, remember, is named for those individuals who were descendants of the younger son of Lot and one of his daughters. The older son, as we pointed out, was Moab. The younger son was ben -Ami according to Genesis 19.38. And so uh, the sons of Ammon are the descendants of this particular boy. Now the Ammonites were regarded as relatives of the Israelites who were commanded to treat them kindly. And they occupied the territory of Zamzumin between the Arnon and Jabuk, uh, Jabuk rivers. And later part of this ter was, territory was taken from them by the Amorites and they were confined to an area to the east of the Jabuk. So these individuals is what we're talking about here this evening that God is going to, is threatening judgment against. Now remember, all these, judge, all these threats of judgment by God are actually expressing God's love for not only Judah and the Jews living during the 70th week of, of Daniel or, and the Gentiles in, in Zephaniah's day in the 7th century BC and the Gentiles living during the 70th week of Daniel. All these prophecies are conditional, meaning if they repent, God will relent and not judge them. So the fact that God, if God's intention was to wipe these people off the face of the earth, he would not even have Zephaniah write this book under his inspiration. The fact that he does means that God wants these people to repent. That's the same principle we saw when Noah, Jonah was told by God to go into Nineveh, a pagan Gentile city, just like the Ammonites were and the, and the Moabites and the Assyrians. The, they were Assyrians, the Ninevites. And so uh, the, God says in 40, through no, uh, Jonah, in 40 days Nineveh will be overthrown. He gave him 40 days. So if his intention was to, what did they do? They repented. They got the message even though they were pagans. And they understood what God was doing for them, giving them opportunity to repent. So that's telling us God's love. God desires all men to be saved. Why? Because he loves all people. He created all people. So people have to, his creatures, whether they're Jew or Gentiles, have to make a decision in relation to their creator and redeemer. And that is to, access, uh, to repent and have faith in him, trust in him, and worship him, and forsake the gods that Satan's kingdom promotes in this world. So look at Zephaniah chapter 2, verse uh, 8 again. It says in verse 8, I have heard the taunting of Moab and the revilings of the sons of Ammon, with which they have taunted my people and become arrogant against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom and the sons of Ammon like Gomorrah, wiped off the face of the earth. A place, settled, a place possessed by nettles and salt pits and a perpetual desolation. Then he says, the, and this is what we'll be looking at here this evening, the remnant of my people will plunder them and the remainder of my nation will inherit them. So we see that phrase, the remnant of my people will plunder them, 
be, between that between that uh, between that statement and the previous one, we have no connective word and or now or but. And uh, that means the figure of ascendanton is being used here. And it's used here to emphasize with us, the reader, uh, the prophetic declaration that the remnant of God's people will plunder the Moabites and the Ammonites. And the original audience, the Jews living in Zephaniah's day, God, that, this figure means that God want them, wants them to meditate upon this for the purpose of personal application. What's that? If you're an unregenerate Jew, repent and trust in the God of Israel, forsake your gods. If you're an unfaithful a regenerate a believer, you are to con uh, confess it, repent by confessing your sins and obeying the Mosaic law. Remember, they were under the law. For the faithful believer, the personal application is continue to remain faithful so that you will not be under God's discipline. So the, the word for remnant, we've seen this word in previous studies in Zephaniah. It's the word she'erit, and this word's translated correctly remnant, and because it means remnant because it pertains to that which is left over from a whole, or that which is part of a whole. And here, it's speaking, of course, of that which was, has survived a pr after a previous elimination process or catastrophe. So this word remnant speaks of a, gr a, a, a group of individuals here who belong to a whole. So we know this is Jewish people who are, have, were remained faithful, had repented, were faithful, and they are part of the, the larger uh, group of the kingdom of Judah, and you can say also the nation of Israel. So this word is also speaking, of the, has the idea of, of these people have survived a catastrophe, a judgment. And so he's speaking, of course, of those Jews who were faithful and trusted in God, and they returned from exile from Babylon after, the, after 70 years in Babylon. So here, again, this word remnant, it refers to those Jews in the kingdom of Judah who would survive the day of the Lord and Zephaniah's day. The day of the Lord, remember, is the day in which God would, would, would uh, exercise his righteous indignation against unrepentant sinners. Now, the word that's translated people, um, it's in the singular, it means people in the sense of a large group based on various cultural, uh, physical, and geographical ties. And the, the, the construct state of this word means it's governing the word that follows it, which is the pronominal su uh, suffix, or the personal pronoun, excuse me, ani, which refers, of course, to the God of Israel. It's translated correctly, my. So the construct state would indicate uh, of this word and the word am, um, uh, or excuse me, ani, it would therefore indicate that Zephaniah is speaking of those members of the kingdom of Judah who possess the covenant relationship with God and compose the remnant that would return from Babylon. So when he says, my people, the construction there in the Hebrew means that God's in a covenant relationship with these people. They're his possession. And in, 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 in back in Zephaniah's day, for a Jew to be God's possession, they would have to have a covenant relationship with him, meaning they trusted in the God of Israel, and they were declared justified, and they became a part of the covenant people Israel. So, the word that's translated uh, plunder there, it's the word bazaz, and this word pertains to carrying off spoils of war, to carry off goods from a conquered people by force after battle, and it's very closely connected with the idea of obedience to God. Now, it goes on to say, it, it, it kind of, um, the next statement, and the remainder of my nation will inherit them, which ends the verse, it's, it's going, uh, this particular word is, uh, this particular phrase is explaining, the phrase, the remainder of my nation will inherit them, is actually explaining specifically for us, the reader, uh, the meaning of that previous prophetic declaration that the remnant of my people will plunder them. So, the, the Moab, the people of Ammon, Ammon and uh, Moab. So, the remnant of my people will plunder them, the Ammonites, the remnant being the Jewish people who survived the judgment because they remained faithful. The phrase, the rain, remainder of my nation will inherit them, is giving us, identifying specifically for us what Paul is, uh, what Paul, what Zephaniah is saying with that statement, the remnant of my people will plunder them. Now, uh, the reason why that is is because of the conjunction they, translated and, and the remainder, and there's the conjunction they, which is introducing a prophetic declaration that is explaining specifically for us, the reader, the meaning of the previous declaration that asserts that the remnant of Judah will plunder the Moabites and the Ammonites. Now, the word that's translated 
uh, in your Bible, in the New American Standard, the remainder, it's, it's speaking of the remnant and, and from a different perspective. It's the word yeter. It means remainder, uh, survivors, remnant. Sometimes you can translate it that way. And it pertains to that which is left over. So it, it contains a lot of the same idea that we saw with this word uh, pre, in the previous prophetic declaration, she'erit, remnant. Now, the word for nation, uh, my nation, the remainder of my nation will inherit them, the lands of Moab and Ammon. The word for nation there is goy, which is kind of interesting, that God is, we saw this earlier in Zephaniah, where God's using this of the remnant of Judah. The word goy there refers, uh, nation, it refers to a large group of people based on various cultural, physical, and geographical ties, extending to clan relationships, and, and thus it refers to a group of people that, fo that form a political entity. So here, it's speaking of the remnant that returns from, uh, of Judah that returns from Babylon. Here, again, it's used with reference to the citizens of Judah who lived during the 6th and 7th centuries BC, who were conquered by Babylon, and it's used in a derogatory sense, since it's usually the word the Hebrews use for unregenerate pagan nations. So basically, God's saying, I, they, they, they survived this, but I don't have, I'm not looking very kindly at, at the nation as a whole. Now, the word that we have for uh, inherit, it's the word nahal. It's an interesting word. It means to take possession. It's translated, will inherit correctly in the New American Standard. This word means to inherit in the sense of taking possession as an inheritance. So... It, the reason why that is, is because this word, nahal, it pertains to receiving a transfer of property from a deceased parent or a living authorized source, and it implies possession, it, that the possession is legitimate according to proper standards, which is kind of interesting here. It's going back to the Abraham and, Abrahamic and Palestinian covenants, this particular word. So this third person masculine plural form of this pronominal suffix, hey ma, it says them. He says, I will, the, uh, the remainder of my nation will inherit them. The word them is the word hema. It's a pronominal suffix. It's correctly translated. It's referring, of course, to the Moabite and the Ammonite people. And it actually contains the figure of metonymy, meaning that the people of Moab and Ammon are put for their land. So that's the idea. So this verb, nahal, will inherit. It indicates that the survivors of the, from the nation of Judah will inherit the land of the Moabites and the Ammonites and it expresses the idea that these survivors from the nation of Judah will take possession of their lands. And this action is legitimate, people, because of what? Because God established an unconditional covenant with the progenitors of the nation of, Israel, of Judah, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which promised them these lands as their possession and their descendants. And we're going to take a look a little, a little quick perusal of those uh, some of those uh, promises, unconditional promises of land to the, the uh, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Those, those unconditional promises of land guarantee that the land over there in the Middle East, and we're going to see tonight, it's much bigger than what they have now. They're basically guaranteed the land of the Middle East. And they haven't taken possession of that. It will find its fulfillment during the millennial kingdom under Jesus Christ which is yet future. So now, uh, let's, we'll see that in a few moments. Let, look at uh, my translation now. Now that we've completed our translation of Zephaniah 2.9, let's read, in my translation, Zephaniah chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And then uh, talk about these last two prophetic statements in Zephaniah 2.9. Look at Zephaniah 2.1 in my translation. Each and every one of you Cause each other to enter the state of being assembled. Yes, assemble together, you totally undesirable nation, the, the kingdom of Judah. Before the decree takes effect, the promise of judgment, yes, the period of judgment flies away like shaft, while the Lord's furious intense anger has by no means taken place against each and every one of you, while the period characterized by the Lord's legitimate anger has by no means taken place against each and every one of you. Continue making it your habit of diligently seeking after the Lord's will, each and every one of you humble people. So now he's talking to the faithful, uh, uh, faithful Jews in the kingdom of Judah and also those who lived during the 70th week in Israel. So he says, continue to make it your habit of diligently seeking after the Lord's will, each and every one of you humble people of the land who are fulfilling his law. See, they're obedient. Each and every one of you, continue to make it your habit of seeking after righteousness. 
Each and every one of you continue making it your habit of seeking after humility. Perhaps each and every one of you will be protected during the period characterized by the Lord's legitimate anger, his righteous indignation against unrepentant sinners. Now, the perhaps there's, it, 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 there's no, the doubt there is whether these people will remain faithful. That's where the question is, will they remain faithful? That's why the word perhaps is there. Then, as I said before, verses 4 through 15 give the positive motivation for obeying those commands in verses 1 and 3. The negative motivation is found in verse 2, as we pointed out. So look at verse 4. For Gaza will exist in the state of being abandoned, also, also, Ashkelon will exist in the state of being desolate. Ashdod, they will cause her inhabitants to be expelled at noon. Also, Ekron's population will be uprooted. Those are Philistine cities, as we pointed out, that were surrounding the kingdom of Judah in the 7th century B.C. So, then it says in verse 5, disaster for those who inhabit the seacoast, namely the Cretan nation. Again, that was uh, found, that, that Cretan nation was in Zephaniah's day like the, the Philistine cities. The message originating from the Lord is directed against each and every one of you inhabitants of Canaan, the inhabitants of the land of the Philistines, because I will surely cause each and every one of you to be killed until there's absolutely not one inhabitant. Now again, remember he's saying that so they will repent so we won't have to do this. So basically this is tough love. Verse 6, consequently, the seacoast will as a certainty be pasture lands, dwelling places for those who are shepherds as well as sheep pens. Indeed, the coast, that's the Mediterranean coast in Zephaniah's day, will as a certainty be for the remnant belonging to the kingdom of Judah. And this was fulfilled in history. They will be shepherds by the sea in the houses of Eshkelon. They will recline during the evening because the Lord, their God, will care for them. In fact, he will surely restore their prosperity. I heard public insults from Moab's people as well as sarcastic insults from Ammon's citizens. This is the uh, indictment against these two nations and their treatment of Israel, which is the cause for this announcement of judgment. So he says in verse 8, I heard public insults from Moab's people as well as sarcastic insults from Ammon citizens. They showed public contempt for my people, the kingdom of Judah, when along with the Babylonian coalition, they defeated Judah. Indeed, they triumphed over their territory. That was fulfilled in history with the Babylonian invasions in the 6th and 7th centuries B.C., then we have verse 9. A result clause starts it off. Consequently, I, existing eternally, the Lord ruling over the armies, the God ruling over, and in a relationship with Israel, declares Moab's people will be like Sodom's people, likewise Ammon's citizens like Gomorrah's people, a place overrun by weeds as well as salt pits, indeed a desolation forever and ever. The remnant from my people will plunder them, specifically the survivors from the nation will inherit their territory. Now, as we see, the, both of these prophetic declarations, the last two, at the end of verse 9, the remnant of my people will plunder them. Specifically, the survivors from the nation will inherit their territory. Those two were fulfilled in history, like the previous prophetic declarations in verses 4 through 8. Now, that's telling us the inspiration of this book, that it's inspired by God. And that's another, as we pointed out, that's something you might want to point out to your unbelieving friends. Use the word of God, the sword of the spirit, to convict them that the Bible's testimony is inspired by God, and especially there's, and also we know, if that's the case, then Jesus, which the Bible says is the Savior, only, no one can come to the Father except through Jesus, faith in Jesus. So that helps us in evangelizing the unsaved, knowing these things, knowing these fulfilled prophecies. Both of these prophetic declarations, again, were fulfilled in history. However, the remnant of Judah, which returned from the Babylon, Babylonian exile, actually did not themselves plunder the Moabites and the Ammonites as a result of achieving a military victory over them. Rather, as it pointed out in Nehemiah and Ezra, they inherited their land and possessions after returning from Babylon, since it was Babylon which conquered these two nations. Remember we saw last week, and second, uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, 2 Kings 24-2, that Moab and Ammon, they joined together to form a coalition with other nations headed up by Babylon to destroy the kingdom of Judah, and to dispossess and exile her people to Babylon. So what happened? Well, these two nations, Babylon turned around and wiped these two nations off the face of the earth. 
And so uh, what comes around goes around. That's God's judgment of these two nations. Medo-Persia, history tells us, and, and the Bible tells us this, this, of course, conquered Babylon, and we saw that in the book of Daniel, and they decreed for the, in Medo-Persia, their kings decreed for the remnant of Judah to return to their land as well as to occupy the lands previously held by the Moabites and the Ammonites. Medo-Persia basically had decrees that not just for Judah, that Judah benefited, but any nation that was dispossessed and exiled and enslaved by Babylon, Medo-Persia freed these people. And Judah was one of those peoples. So... This was a legitimate, the fact, this, this legitimate transfer of possession. Remember, this remnant of Judah comes back from Babylon after 70 years in Babylon, and they dispossessed those nations, Moab and Ammon, and the other Philistine, Philistine cities, Philistine nation, and the Cretan nation. All dispossessed, but they never, raised the, they never raised the spear in anger. It was Babylon who did all this for them. And of course, remember, Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon was God's instrument, his servant. Jeremiah chapter 27, we pointed out. So this was a legitimate transfer of possession because God, as we pointed out, established a covenant with the progenitors of the kingdom of Judah, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in which he promised these men and their descendants that they would possess the lands previously held by the Moabites and the Ammonites. Now, as we noted in a, a few weeks ago, the Palestinian covenant, is, we call it, is in fact an extension of the Abrahamic covenant, which is recorded in Genesis 12, 1-3. The Lord's promise of land to Abram and his descendants in Genesis chapter 13, verses 14-17, is an extension upon the, his promise to Abram in Genesis 12, 1, and thus related to the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Palestinian covenant, again, which is an extension of the Abrahamic covenant, deals with the promise of land to, the, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. This covenant was, co was, uh, was a confirmation and a, an enlargement of the original Abrahamic covenant, and it amplified the land features of the Abrahamic covenant. Now, the Palestinian covenant was confirmed to Isaac, Genesis 26, 3 and 4. Jacob, Genesis 35, 12. Reiterated to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 through 8 who described the geographical boundaries of the land in Numbers 34, 1 through 2. And by the way, those uh, land uh, boundaries, geographical boundaries, is the basis for what I'm going to tell you that Israel is going to possess in the future during the millennial reign of Christ and has never yet uh, possessed in its history to the full extent. So the Palestinian covenant was... Pro uh, was uh, uh, the fulfillment of this particular uh, promise of land to Israel, uh, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fulfillment of this covenant will take place during the millennium, according to De Deuteronomy chapter 30, 1 through 9. So, uh, I want to take a, let's take a quick perusal of these passages of promises of land, to the, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, the guarantee of land, we could say. Look at Genesis chapter 12, verse 1, please. medication I was just thinking about that she doesn't have her she, she has to eat with it too doesn't she what a hobo this is a hobo yeah yeah oh yeah oh yeah thank you for everybody thank you for everybody else oh yeah look at Genesis 12 1 now the Lord said to Abram go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which, unless, unless maybe that was deliberate. <laughs> I, don't, I shouldn't say that. Genesis 12, 1. <laughs> Knowing teenagers the way I do. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, and maybe not, and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now look at, uh, keep going. So Abram went forth as the Lord had spoken to him, and Lot went with him. Now Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. 
Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions, which they had accumulated, and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and thus they came to the land of Canaan. Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the oak of Morah. And the, now the Canaanite was then in the land. And the, by doing that, basically that's what they did in the ancient world. When you owned something, you would walk through it. Now, it says in verse 7, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, think about this. And look at this passage, prophecy. We've seen this in the past. In light of the historical things that have gone on in the past and what's going on now in history. All the, conf all the, the, the conflict over the land there. Who has possession of the land? Who has right to the land? Israel does. End of discussion. The descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, God is the owner of the land. He says who goes on in there. And he's already decreed in his word who he wants to have possession of the land. Not the Arabs. Okay. Now, look at Genesis chapter 13. Look at Genesis chapter 13. Verse 14. Genesis 13, look at verse 14. Now, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. We studied this. It was a high plateau. For all the land which you see, I will give it to you and to your descendants forever. Where he was standing, and you could do it there today, you can see all the way to Iraq. Because the land they, God's promising him is going to go all the way to the Euphrates River in Iraq. It's hard to believe that because... We're thinking of America, we have vast spaces. Of, it's, that, it's, that, it's not that big track of land that, that between, you know, Mediterranean and the Euphrates. So, for all the land which you see, I will give it to you and your descendants forever, he says. So, then he says, verse 16, I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants can also be numbered. Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I will give it to you. So that, again... Telling him to do that means, it, it, in the ancient world, it implies ownership. I'm walking through it because you, you are the owner now. That's what he was doing. So that's, the, that's, a, that's a, some of the promises there with the Palestinian covenant. Look at Numbers. Look at the book of Numbers. And look at Numbers chapter 34. Look at verse 1. Now, in this chapter, we have Moses, you know, God giving Mo, uh, Moses instructions with regards to appropriating the, uh, you know, g uh, giving out portions, tracts of land to the various tribes of Israel. Okay? So look what he says in, in Numbers 34, 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land of Canaan, this is the land that shall fall to you as an inheritance, even the land of Canaan according to its borders. Your southern, now this is what he says, your southern sector shall extend from the wilderness of Zin alongside, along the side of Edom, and your southern border shall extend from the end of the salt sea eastward. Then your border shall turn direction from the south to the ascent of Akrabim and continue to Zin, and its termination shall be to the south of Kadesh Barnea, and it shall reach Hazad, Hazar, Adar, and continue to Asman. The border shall turn direction from Asman to the brook of Egypt, and its termination shall be at the sea. As for the western border, you shall have the great sea. That's the Mediterranean. That is, is, that is its coastline. This shall be your west border. And this shall be your north border. You shall draw your border line from the great sea to Mount Hor. You shall draw a line from Mount Hor to the Labo Hamath, and the termination of the border shall be at Zadad. And the border shall proceed to Ziphron, and its termination shall be Haza Anan. This shall be your north border. For your eastern border, you shall also draw a line from Haza Anan to Shephem, and the border shall go down to, from Shephem to Riblah on the east side of Ain. Ein, and the border shall go down and reach to the slope on the east side of the sea of Kenareth. And uh, when we saw that with uh, Zephaniah chapter 2, speaking of the Cretans. And the, the border shall go down to the, the place where the Cretans used to be, uh, 
reside. And the border shall go down to the Jordan, and its termination shall be the Salt Sea. This shall be your land according to borders all around. Now, I want you to go over to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 1. So it shall be, when all of these things have come upon you, I mean the, the blessing and the cursing, which he's talking about in Genesis 20, uh, Deuteronomy 28 and 29, which I have set before you, and you shall call them to mind in all the nations where the Lord your God has banished you, exiled you, and you return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and soul, repent, according to all that I command you today, you and your sons, then the Lord your God will restore you from captivity. And this happened at 70 years after the after uh, being deported to Babylon. Then your Lord, your God will restore you from captivity and have compassion on you and will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are at the ends of the earth, from there the Lord your God will gather you and from there he will bring you back. And th this uh, regathering has taken place a couple times in history and it's going to take place in the future. And uh, then it says in verse 5, Then the Lord your God will bring you into the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he will prosper you and multiply you more than your fathers. Moreover, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart, the heart of your descendants, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, so that you may live. Actually, what's going on, as I said before, early, and I think a couple, several weeks ago, that actually there's prophecies in regards to the return of, this, of, of Jews to the land of Israel, but they're not regenerate yet. Uh, remember the dead bones passage is not in Ze Ezekiel 37. They don't come to life until God breathes in them the breath of life, his, his, his life, in his spirit. So basically when he's talking about circumcise your heart, he's talking about them getting regenerated. So once Israel's back in the land, they're going to turn, in, in this, during the 70th week, the, during the tribulation period, they're going to turn to Jesus and have faith in him. In fact, eventually when Christ comes back in the second advent, the majority, in contrast to the first advent, will trust in him as Savior. Paul talks about this in Romans 11, 20, uh, 5 through 27, and also Ze Zechariah 14 and 12, those chapters. They'll look on whom they pierced, and they they'll, they'll, uh, they'll express regret for what they did to Jesus, their forefathers did to him. Verse 7, the Lord your God will inflict all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you, who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the Lord and observe all his commandments, which I command you today. This will be fulfilled again, as I said before, in history during the second advent, 70th week of Daniel. Verse 9, then the Lord your God, he says, uh, then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly. That'll be the millennial reign. He'll do this. And all the work of your hand and in the offspring of your body and in the offspring of your cattle and in the produce of your ground for the Lord will again rejoice over you for good just as he rejoiced over your fathers. This has never taken place in history. These verses, they're fulfilled. You're going to be finding their fulfillment in the, history, in the future because it'll be during the millennial reign in Christ that the nation of Israel will have trusted in the Lord and the Lord will bless them as he's just promised. that He's not blessed them because of their un, they're regenerate today. Except there's a small remnant of Jewish believers in the church age who are blessed by God because of their faith in Jesus, but the nation as a whole has not done that. So he's talking about the nation as a whole there. Now, uh, that being said, those, after we looked at a perusal of those passages, especially the ones with the border, uh, the border issues, we see that the land grant, the land promised to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the kingdom of Judah, the nation of Israel, it covers most of the land of Turkey, it also most of East Africa, and Saudi Arabia, Yemen today, Oman, and the Red Sea, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan. The land grant has boundaries on the Mediterranean, we read, on the Aegean Sea, on, a, on the Euphrates River, and the Nile River. So, they have, that's what, but of course they've never taken possession of that land. Remember the tribe, not all the tribes of Israel had the faith to dispossess the Canaanite peoples. So they never, they didn't, I think the number is not, not one thirtieth of the promise of land did Israel ever possess it in history, ever. So now they just have this little tract of land that they have. But during the millennial kingdom, this will find its fulfillment that they possess all this land. 
and their borders will be this large. Quite fascinating. Now, go back down to Zephaniah 2.9, please. Zephaniah 2.9, as was the case in Zephaniah 2.7, which we read a few moments ago, these last two prophetic declarations recorded in Zephaniah 2.9 brings into view the remnant doctrine, which speaks of a remainder of righteous people of God who survived judgment or catastrophe. Uh, and we've touched on this several times thus far in our study of Zephaniah, so I'm just going to go brief, briefly review for you this particular doctrine. In the Old Testament, in relation to the nation of Israel, a remnant referred to a small percentage of the population of the nation of Israel who survived divine judgment in the form of the Assyrian and Babylonian invasions and deportations. Now the concept has its roots, and we've covered these verses in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 27 through 31, De Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 62 through 68, and Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 through 10, which we just read. In these passages, Moses, as we saw, warns Israel that they would be dispersed throughout the nations for their disobedience, but God would bring them back to the land based upon his policy of grace and his covenantal faithfulness. The prophets, subsequent to Moses, continued this doctrine when teaching the nation of Israel uh, during the time each lived. The prophet Jeremiah, he speaks, he uses the, uh, the, the concept of the remnant in his writings. Zechariah does as well. He speaks of a remnant of Israelites during the millennial reign of Christ. Now this remnant, remember the doctrine, remnant doctrine, the remnant can be small or it can be large. Well, it's going to be, it's small now in history, and it has been throughout history, but in the millennial kingdom, it's a large remnant, okay? So the prophet might, so I don't want you to think that the word remnant simply means a small portion all the time. It doesn't. It could be, it, the size is, is really not the big issue. It's just saying that the issue is there's going to be a faithful group that will survive out of the whole mass of Jews that has, that has lived in history. So the prophet Micah, he also speaks of a future remnant of, is, of Israelites during the millennium. And so does Zephaniah, as we've seen in Zephaniah 2, 7 and 9, and we'll see in Zephaniah 3, 13 in the future. The remnant doctrine also appears in the writings of Isaiah. It's used in Nehemiah, Nehemiah 1, 3. It's found in the writings of Ezra, of the returning Israelites from Babylon. Haggai, the prophet Haggai, he speaks of this remnant that returned from Babylon. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 12 and 14, and Haggai 2, 2. Paul mentions this remnant doctrine in the New Testament, specifically in the book of Romans. A book I think everyone, if you're a part of this ministry or just some become a part of this ministry, it wouldn't be a bad idea to either read my articles on, on Romans or watch the classes, listen to the classes, because that book is... There's a lot in that book that we studied. And basically, it's the plan of God, is what Paul gives us. And it helps us understand um, also the, ch the church's relationship to Israel and how they're distinct from each other. Now, the obvious invocation, uh, so, so again, stop there for a second. Romans, in the New Testament, Paul talks about a remnant in, in, in his day. And he was a part of that, a, a, a group of people, Jews, who had trusted in Jesus. The, in his day, like it is today, in our day and age, the majority of Jews had rejected Jesus as their savior. Only apostles of Jesus, Jewish apostles, and the disciples who were Jewish in Israel trusted in Jesus. But that's, again, that will flip-flop when we get to the second advent and millennial reign of Christ. So, the remnant doctrine in Paul's writings, and particularly the book of Romans, is found in Romans 9.6, 9, 27 through 29, uh, Romans 10, 16, and also Romans 11, 5, where he talks, quoting, quoting Kings and Elijah, where Elijah said when he was being chased down by uh, Jezebel, uh, Ahab's wife, and threatening him with death to kill him uh, after he just wiped out the prophets of Baal uh, courageously, uh, he, God says to him, when he was hiding out, he said, Elijah, I, you know, I have 7,000 and have not bowed the knee to Baal. You're not the only guy here on the earth. You're not the only guy who's being faithful, which is a good lesson for all of us here in the church age. And, uh, you know, here in, especially here, uh, for us Christians, our church out here in Iowa, 
they're, we're not the only Christians that are faithful to God. <laughs> there are other Christians that are faithful to God. Don't think for one minute that we're the only people in Iowa that are faithful to God. Though I think that number is, is small nonetheless. Now the obvious, uh, look at Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 9 again. The last, two, prof the, the last prophetic, two prophetic declarations that we've been looking at, where it says in my translation, the remnant from my people will plunder them, the Moabites and the Ammonites, specifically the survivors from the nation, the nation of Judah, will inherit their territory. Now the obvious implication from these last two prophetic declarations is that God would have mercy on those in the kingdom of Judah who would survive the judgment the Lord would inflict upon the nation for their unrepentant disobedience. God would exercise mercy towards those in the nation who repented and were faithful to him. He would restore them as a nation and prosper them in the future after judging the nation. However, the Moabites and the Ammonites would not be extended the same mercy, implying that these nations did not repent. If they repented, like the people in Nineveh, another pagan Gentile group of people, God would have relented and he would have, he would have been merciful to them, forgave them. But they didn't do that. We know they didn't do that because God judged them. If they had repented, he wouldn't have judged them. Simple case, simple. Not that difficult to see. Now, mercy, what is mercy? Because God's saying, and, not, and the implication is, the obvious implication, as I pointed out, with these two prophetic declarations at the end of verse 9 of chapter 2 of Zephaniah, is that God was going to be merciful to these people. He's going to be merciful to them. Mercy is God acting upon his policy of grace. And his policy of grace flows from his attribute of love. If you look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. So mercy is God acting upon his policy of grace, which flows from his attribute of love and withholding judgment. So when you think of mercy, think of God withholding judgment. And also, when you think of grace, think of unmerited blessings. Unmerited means we don't earn or deserve anything. It's not meritorious to be obedient to God or to trust in him. Faith is non-meritorious. It complies with God's, corresponds and is in agreement with God's grace policy because grace is all that God is free to do in imparting unmerited blessings to sinners who have been declared justified through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Or in other words, it's all that God is free to do in imparting an unmerited blessing to, un, un, uh, to justified sinners based upon what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. So mercy is a manifestation of who God is, and thus it helps to compose his glory. Uh, one more passage. Look at Exodus chapter 34, a book we studied in detail. Exodus chapter 34. Look at verse 1. Now, what we see in Exodus 34, remember when you know, God had Moses go up to give him the Ten Commandments, comes back down, God says, those stiff-necked people of yours, <laughs> they're, gonna, they've already, they're already in idolatry already. They're already breaking my law. So he, Moses comes down, he breaks the tablets because he's angry, and now he has to go back up again and replace the tablets. So chapter 34 says, verse 1 says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone, two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning, which is actually a, a, a kind of a, an uh, you know, that, that reflects the idea that Israel has broken God's law. The breaking of the tablets. Verse 2, so be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. No man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. So he cut out two stone tablets like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him, and he took his took two stone tablets in his hand. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Now what he was about to say to him is said in other places in the Old Testament. And it talks about the mercy of God, though it's not explicit. Uh, well, in these translations. Verse 6, Then the Lord passed by in front of him. Verse 6. And he says, And proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, 
who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. So notice, that's mercy. I'm giving you, the fact that God gives forgiveness to us when we confess our sins or trust in Jesus as our Savior to be declared justified is an expression of the fact that God's withholding judgment. He is being merciful to us. He's being, according to his grace policy. We don't earn or deserve it. We should, be, we should have faith in him. We should obey him. And so he's forgiving us for our, our sinful behavior. So he's merciful. The idea of loving kindness and forgiveness and also gracious there, the word gracious there, it speaks of God's mercy. So uh, as we close here, go back to Zephaniah 2.9. So in, in the last two statements there, in Zephaniah 2.9, I'm reading from my translation. It says, the remnant for my people, that's the kingdom of Judah, will plunder them, the Moabite people and the Ammonite people, specifically the survivors from the nation, the remnant again of Judah, will inherit their territory. And as I said before, this was fulfilled in history, both of those statements. With, remember, Babylon destroyed Moab, and the people of Moab exiled them or killed them on the battlefield, and they were dispossessed and Ammon, and they never return to the land again. And who comes back? Israel's deported. Judah's deported, the southern kingdom. They come back 70 years later, according to Jeremiah's prophecy and fulfillment of it. They come, Daniel mentions this. And they come back, and they come back 70 years later, and what do they do? They inherit these very lands in fulfillment of these prophecies, which again expresses the, the fact that this particular book is inspired by God. The Bible is inspired by God, and... This is very important that we know for two reasons. One for evangelistic purposes and one for our own walk with God. For our own walk with God, it's telling us, I can trust God's word. I can live my life according to this God's word. I can hang my hat on God's word because it's a guarantee, whatever it says. I, am, I, am, I can hang my hat on God's word where the world, nothing in this world can give us any guarantees, but God's word can give us guarantees. God keeps his word. He fulfills his promises. So therefore, we, if that's the case, we need to, to trust in his word for our own walk with God. It also should be used, as I said before, this information, this fulfillment of prophecy, to and, and motivate us to evangelize the unsaved in our lives with fulfilled prophecy. I said before in the past, that's how I got saved. I had a guy who was talking eschatology, talking prophecy with me, and, uh, you know, and dispensationalist, and he told, I was like, wow. I, was, I said, wow, the Bible is something else. I never knew this because I was a Catholic and nobody taught me the Bible. They didn't teach the Bible in, in Catholic and catechism or what we had. We didn't, get, we didn't know any of this stuff. Man, once I got started sm having a sniff of this, I never looked back. It was just amazing. So, again, don't run away from the word of God when it comes to evangelizing the unsaved. There's no need to do that, and I'm living proof. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that the Holy Spirit would challenge us and encourage us and instruct us with what we've heard and rebuke us and reprove us if necessary. In our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.